So we'll start A'uz Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-teen. Rabbi Shurah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa halul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta taj'alu al-hazna iza shi'ta sahlan. Ya fattahu ya Ali maftah lana fathan qariba. Because I want to discuss how Muslim women were instrumental in creating one of the most powerful civilizations in history. And if that happened in the past, it can happen uh, in the future as well, in the present as well. So that's what I'm going to be discussing. Muslim women and the forthcoming Islamic revival, the role of Muslim women in this forthcoming Islamic revival. So the topics that would be covered, uh, firstly, would be the role of women in the building of the Islamic civilization. So the historical part of my uh, presentation. Then what we can get from that are great female role models and super achievers from our glorious past. Then I'm gonna be discussing a few of the current challenges uh, facing the Ummah. And finally, what are our responsibilities of, of, of Muslim women today with respect to uh, the severe challenges that we have uh, in the Ummah today? So Islamic history essentially is the most unique. Why? Because for the first time in human history, there was an unprecedented rise in female scholarship. Never before in history were women so instrumental in the intellectual development of a civilization. All this because the Prophet ﷺ emphasized on the education of men and women equally. How can, now keeping all of that in mind, okay, so I'm going to prove it to you how women were so instrumental in the building of the Islamic civilization. But then the question would be, how can we as Muslim women today in the 21st century reclaim this glorious legacy and work towards the imminent Islamic revival, which has been prophesied by the Prophet ﷺ himself. That's something that we want to be talking about. Many people are not aware that the Prophet ﷺ emphatically uh, pro prophesied about um, an Islamic, a global Islamic revival in the end times. And we are almost somewhere near that, inshallah. So keeping that in mind, I want to start off with a story. Uh, this is a story about a woman who disrupted a court hearing. So this is uh, the time of the Tabi'in, uh, the second generation after the Prophet Sallallahu There was a theft case in Medina uh, and the judge was about to pass the verdict of the Islamic punishment for theft, uh, which is the cutting of the hands. Suddenly, a female came in and this was a servant of uh, a woman scholar, female scholar named Amra bint uh, Abdurrahman, who interrupted the hearing. So the female servant came in, spoke to uh, the judge, interrupted the co court hearing. Now, Amra bint Abdurrahman was a very important uh, scholar. She was educated by uh, Aisha radiallahu anh, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu who is one of the most uh, eminent Muslim scholars from the first generation. And we're gonna learn a little bit about her. So, but here it was Amra bint uh, Abdurrahman who had sent message to uh, the judge of that time in Medina to stop the court hearing immediately. Why? She said, she sent this mes message to her servant, that you cannot apply the punishment on a thief who has stolen an item below a quarter of a dinar. So this is like a, a, you know, a matter of jurisprudence law, Islamic law, that uh, the punishment has to be applied 
only on people who steal something of worth, of value, above a quarter of a dinar. So this particular person had uh, not done so, and Amra bint Abdurrahman was following the case. She had the knowledge more than the judge who was judging at that time in the court in Medina. And what does the judge do? Immediately, immediately, he uh, reverted his, his verdict, his judgment for the thief, and he followed Amra bint Abdurrahman's uh, guidance. And this is a time when there were, in history, we know uh, there were seven illustrious judges in Medina at that time. So Medina was bubbling with scholarship, with knowledge. You had like a scholar at every kilometer, almost you could say, every meter of uh, uh, Medina in the masjid, outside the masjid. And this particular judge who was handling this case doesn't go to, you know, maybe another one of his male colleagues or, uh, you know, take a maybe a consultation with uh, one of the seven illustrious judges in Medina. No, immediately, Amra bint Abdurrahman, uh, because he knew. Now, the question is, why would he do that? This is a matter of justice. Why would somebody do that? Unless and until they are sure that this woman is a knowledgeable woman. This woman is rooted, grounded, in firm knowledge. And that's why he didn't feel the need of having a consultation with anybody. He just went ahead with whatever Amra bint Abdurrahman uh, had to say. And that is the trust that our previous generations had in scholarship. It wasn't really about gender. It was really about knowledge. And whether it was a man or a woman, as long as you have knowledge, that's enough. And, you know, I'm going to debunk all of the ignorant and Islamophobic misconceptions about, you know, how the Quran says that you cannot take, uh, you know, uh, uh, the witness of a single uh, woman. It has to be two women together. And that means that women are not intellectually bright, according to the Quran. All of that is just not right absolutely incorrect because we're going to see from the time of the Prophet and many, many centuries after that, that women's scholarship were an, you know, unalienable part of the Islamic civilization. And there was nothing like that. A woman's opinion was as equal to a man's opinion, many a times even preferred. Why? Not because of the gender. The gender wasn't not even concerned in all of this. The gender was completely, uh, you know, ignored in situations like this. Be why? Because knowledge was central. As long as you're knowledgeable, your opinion counts. And that is something which uh, is well articulated by Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Akram Nadwi. He says, I do not know of another religious tradition in which women were so central, so present, so active in its formative history. It follows that they were recognized as senior. They weren't just, you know, on the sidelines. No, they were recognized as senior in a social order in which authority was explicitly based upon commitment to and knowledge of the religion. So what was important is just how committed are you and how knowledgeable are you of the religion. Doesn't really matter whether you're a man or a woman, you're literally on the same level because of that, if your knowledge is on the same level. And that is what we see again and again in our study of Islamic history. And so, so that we get a better picture of why it was so, why was it this way? Why was there this very explicit display of equality, uh, gender equality in all areas? Because most of what we do in our life is knowledge based. And when knowledge is put on like, a, you know, on a particular platform and everybody has equal access to it and people will only be judged according to how much knowledge you have, the necessary result is that there would be equality within people. And the only gradations that we would find is based on how much knowledgeable you are and how much are you applying that knowledge in your life. So Islam essentially, if there are different definitions 
of Islam. And one of the definitions is that it's literally a tradition that's obsessed with knowledge, literally. Like, I mean, it started with the word Ikra, which is read, that was the first revelation to the Prophet And then it's literally all about reading, all about knowledge. You cannot be a Muslim unless and until you set out on a path to gain knowledge because knowledge is a sure path to paradise. The Prophet said, whoever travels a path in search of knowledge, Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise. Knowledge is both a means and an end. And it is the purpose of our life. How is it uh, both a means and an end? Of course, you cannot gain uh, the nearness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowing him. And at the end, when you reach him, and you are awarded with his nearness and his, um, you know, vision, that in essentially is a manifestation of more and more, greater and greater knowledge of him, ma'arifa of him, right? So the purpose of our life, the purpose of our life, uh, the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we created humanity and jinns to worship us. And the commentators of the Quran, they say this worship is built, is based on our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot worship anyone or love anyone until and unless you don't know them. So knowing is a prerequisite for worship. And that's the purpose of our creation. The Shahada, which is the central tenet of Islam, is a thing to know. We have to, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, know that there is fa'alam annahu la ilaha illallah. So this is a thing to be known. And a beautiful hadith where the Prophet says, the angels lower their wings for the seeker of knowledge, the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth, even the fish in the depths of the water, seek forgiveness for the scholar. So imagine yourself, you're shopping, you're taking a nap, you're out with your friends, and the fish in the depths of the water, the fish in the water, uh, in one narration, even the ants on the earth are praying for your forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive so and so. Why? Because you're a seeker of knowledge. What a privilege. So, Another uh, way of describing Islam, that, like I said, Islam could be, you know, you can describe uh, Islam, there's so many definitions of Islam, essentially, but uh, I've taken these various dimensions of Islam. So Islam can be understood as a social revolution, literally, it's a social revolution. What actually happened from the first formative years of uh, the prophethood of uh, the Prophet, uh, the movement actually was centered on la ilaha illallah and social equality. Everybody is equal in the sight of God. The fact that God is one and he's the only one worthy of worship. He created mankind and humanity and everybody is equal. So social equality, that means gender equality. Everybody is equal. Uh, men and women are equal. Uh, we remember in the Quran, the first few uh, uh, surahs that were revealed to the Prophet were actually about uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuked those who used to bury their daughters alive in pre-Islamic Arabia. So that was one of uh, the Prophet sallallahu primary, uh, you know, uh, missions, gender equality. Culture, the Islamic civilization, uh, the Islam as a religion created a culture, and then economic egalitarianism, like in the sense when it comes to economy of a state, of a, a polity, everybody should have equal opportunities. So free and fair trade, which was established in Medina, the first welfare state. So it's a social revolution. Islam can also be understood as a political revolution. Uh, you saw massive territorial expansion. You saw the rule of the most worthy and, you know, in political science, it's a, in, there are lots of debates and lots of theories of who is, who must rule. Should we have a government based on hierarchy, which is monarchy, or should we have a government based on people, everybody is equal, an 18-year-old intellect and uh, a 50-year-old intellect all go and vote 
for their leader? Or should we have uh, the rule of somebody who is, you know, uh, a, a most worthy, it used to be called an aristocracy. And Islam actually established that the rule, uh, the right to rule should be given to somebody who is the most worthy, who's not desirous of the job, but is in, its, in himself, in herself, the most worthy. And in all strata, not only political leadership, in all uh, domains. So thus we saw the establishment of the first welfare state in Medina. Right. So the rights of minorities, we saw how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with the Jewish communities and women, children, preserved through the text of the Quran. So there we see that aspect of Islam. But what I want to, you know, in my talk today, uh, concentrate on the most is the intellectual revolution. This, this particular dimension of Islam, because that's where, we, that's where the key lies. And that's where, you know, we're going to see, you know, essentially the main characteristics of Islam coming out. And that is its intellectual revolution. Like I said, it started with the letter, with uh, the word Iqra, to read, a command to read. So read in the name of thy Lord. That's how Islam started. And literally all of Islamic history is all about that. So pre-Islamic, now a bit of comparison, uh, pre-Islamic civilizations, the Greeks, the Indians, the Chinese, uh, they existed, of course, uh, the Indians and the Chinese contemporaneously with the uh, Muslim civilization. But there were really big differences between Islam and these civilizations that these civilizations firstly were restricted to ethnicities and geographies. We know that Greeks were Greeks because they lived in that particular part of the world and they spoke a particular language and particular uh, you know, geographies that they had. So education, if you talk about education, was pursued only by the elites. With the advent of Islam, that completely changed. Firstly, you had a civilization that wasn't limited to a geography, wasn't just the Arabs, uh, different ethnicities became Muslim. So the Muslim civilization was a multi-ethnic uh, civilization. And then the Islamic civilization, because it was built on the foundations of Iqra, which is read, it sparked the first international intellectual revolution. International because it spanned from uh, China uh, to, to North Africa, different nations, different ethnicities, intellectual, because literally it was, you know, a knowledge, of, a, a revolution of knowledge. You couldn't be a Muslim if you didn't know and you had to know and what all you had to know actually increased with time. Islam democratized and universalized education. That is the genius of Islam, that it's not just the elite who have to study. It's not just the scholars who have to study. Everybody needs to know. I mean, you don't have to be a scholar to know. You have to be a Muslim to know basic stuff. Then you can maybe even uh, specialize in it. But basic stuff has to be known by everyone. So Islam took the common folk, the, uh, the, the, the consumers within a society, and turned them into scholars. And we see that in Islamic history, uh, the best scholars, the best, one of the most influential commentator on the Quran from this uh, generation of the Sahaba was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Who was he before Islam? He was a shepherd. A shepherd turned into the biggest, most influential scholars. And with that, with Islam being a, uh, an, an intellectual revolution, you had the development of religious sciences. Firstly, for the first few centuries, you had a rigorous development of uh, religious sciences. So you saw a lot of uh, emphasis on hadith, on fiqh, uh, on tafsir, on sira, uh, all of that, and uh, kalam. Then later on came the development of science, philosophy, and technology. With the development of religious sciences, a methodology was built, a framework was built, the impetus was present. Then came uh, the, you know, the debates of 
theology. Theology also brought in a lot of philosophy, or it could be argued that first came philosophy, then came theology, and they were co contemporaneous. And then the growing needs of the ever-expanding empire uh, of Islam required science and technology to be developed. How do you calculate uh, the time for uh, the five daily prayers where, when you're outside Mecca, when you're far off, how do you calculate uh, the Qibla, direction towards the Qibla needs a lot of mathematics, needs a lot of uh, astronomy. How do you, how do you calculate, uh, you know, the uh, calendar, uh, the lunar calendar accurately and uh, the other things that led to the development of astronomy, of medicine, of course, so important, geography and all of that. So, we saw academic innovations like peer review, citations, all of that is used like today in the contemporary world in uh, academia. Like for example, if I write a paper, I can't just write my own views. Uh, I can have my own views, but I have to substantiate it, uh, all of those views by somebody who's written before me or some other scho a scholar, some other paper, some other book, and I have to cite them. And they would in their uh, research cite somebody else. And they would in their research cite somebody, somebody else. So you have like a chain uh, of research, literally academic chain, connecting scholars over time, uh, over different fields of research. And this came from where? This came from the development of Hadith literature. It was in uh, the development of the Hadith tradition that you had the chains, the narration goes to this scholar, heard from this scholar, heard from this scholar, heard from the Prophet And we still have these chains even till today after 1400 years. That's the miracle of Islam. So one of the innovations uh, from uh, the Islamic world that is carried on even till today in the secular sciences. Universities, and we're going to be talking about how a Muslim woman uh, literally led to the establishment of the world's first university. Research centers, you had the Abbasid Caliph uh, develop and establish a Be uh, Beit al Hikmah. Darul Hikmah, uh, which was literally the, uh, a research center, like a medieval research center. Scholars would come, translate, re do their research, and it was all funded by the government. That was, you could call a medieval research center. Designation like the chair, which is used for professorship, was uh, also came for, from the kursi that uh, an imam or a teacher used to sit on and everybody else used to sit below. And attire like the graduation cloak, the loose cloak that we wear, the mortar board, the cap that we wear when we graduate, all of that are inductions from the Islamic world. Diplomas and PhDs actually are inductions of the Islamic world in the form of ijazas that religious scholars still get whenever they complete their study of a text or uh, you know, hadith. Okay, so moving on. Now I want to take you through uh, like different generations. So the first generation is the Sahabiyat and their quest for knowledge. The Prophet وسلم, uh, equally stressed the education of women and men. But when he said seeking knowledge is obligatory for all Muslims. Uh, so it's for everyone, it doesn't discriminate. And the Sahabiyah, the first generation of female Muslims, they were very quick in understanding that this is including them. And they were, you know, competing with each other and with the men in uh, the uh, seeking of knowledge because they understood that that is a sure path to their salvation. A separate day was allotted for the education of women specifically. This was in Medina. The women requested the Prophet and gave them a separate day. So they had all the days that the men had, then they had a separate day for themselves. So they had literally doubled the attention of the Prophet The Prophet gave special attention to the intellectual and religious needs and queries of Muslim women. And throughout history, we see that women used to come to him and he would literally turn his whole self, address the question well, ask if he was 
you know, uh, if they understood it, if their problem uh, was dealt with. And that's how he created a culture of asking questions and an intellectual atmosphere in Medina. Women uh, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ were regular attendees at the masjid. And that is proved by numerous narrations regarding them and from them. It's very unfortunate that today we have people who argue against this or they don't leave uh, you know, space for uh, Muslim women in masajid. It's very unfortunate. But the practice of the Prophet ﷺ was that you always had women attending the masjid for all five prayers, even for the late night prayer and Fajr prayer, which is very uncommon even. Uh, I mean, today with, with the ease and you know, uh, travel, you can just take your car and go and many cities are even uh, safe. But this was practiced 1400 years back. Women participated in every important event in early Muslim history, name it, and they were there. Be it the Meccan trials before you had the first uh, uh, martyr in Islam was a woman. The first Muslim was a woman. That was Khadija radiallahu because the Prophet was the prophet. The first person who actually uh, became a Muslim was a woman, Khadija radiallahu The first person who was martyred in the way of Islam was a woman. That was Sumayya, Hazrat Sumayya radiallahu Then you had important events like the Hijrah to Abyssinia, Hijrah to Medina, the Battle of Badr, Uhud Khanda, Khudaybiya, Umrah, the Umrah that the Prophet did, the last Hajj that he did. Women participated equally. And uh, there, the the they had these phenomenal, you know, characteristics that they had amazing memories. When you read Islamic history, you're just amazed by the fact that they could memorize so much so quickly, and they memorized the Quran and lengthy hadith. Now, just to give you a few examples, you had Aisha radiallahu an. She's one of the top five narrators of hadith. She's narrated some 2,100 something hadith. And the Sahaba in later generations used to flock to her house and ask her fatawa, her legal rulings on issues of personal law and inheritance. So she was considered a very, very significant and influential scholar in her generation and even uh, the succeeding generation. Uh, and her fatawa were taken by all uh, of uh, the Muslim leaders, the, you know, uh, the righteous uh, caliphs after the Prophet Hafsa bint Umar, uh, another one of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu's wife and the daughter of Umar radiallahu she was given the responsibility of safekeeping the only written copy of the Quran. At that time, there was just one copy of the Quran that, and that was in the uh, hands and uh, the safekeeping, under the safekeeping of a woman. Um Salama, another, uh, you know, uh, one of our mothers, the mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, she was also a very important figure when it came to narrating hadith and also giving fatawa. The Prophet وسلم, used to consult with her and uh, uh, in, in Islamic history, we know the famous incident of Hudaybiyah where she was the one who, who suggested that the Prophet وسلم, do this and that would ease him of his trouble. And he did that and it worked. So all of these ideas, I'm trying to change some of uh, the misconceptions, very uh, deep and also very dangerous misconceptions that have been put in our minds by, by either non-Muslims who are Islamophobic and certain very ignorant uh, Muslim men and women also that uh, somehow as if you know women are of uh, a weaker intellect. Uh, we have the Prophet وسلم, and his Sahaba consulting women uh, always, and that just completely destroys uh, all of these, you know, 
terrible things that are said. Uh, I love this beautiful incident, and I want you to appreciate this. It wasn't just the Prophet ﷺ, it wasn't just the Sahaba, it was literally the participation of women and uh, the consideration that the women, women are central, women are important, are influential in uh, the development of this beautiful religion. It was actually um, you know, established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you, me, and all of the Muslim women through our generation to feel that, you know, no, no matter what anybody says, you are as equal and as beloved and as central to the development and the establishment of this religion as any other man, no matter how great he is. And this uh, is uh, the incident. Uh, the Prophet's wife, Um Salama, she asked the Prophet uh, that why are we, that is women, not mentioned in the Quran as the men are mentioned? Now, a point here uh, in the Quran, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, or he addresses like, Oh, you who believe, in Arabic grammar, it actually includes women. Uh, so uh, the male plural actually includes everyone. It's like everyone. Oh, you who believe, men and women. But if you want to be really specific, that's when you mention the, uh, the feminine form as well. So that's what uh, um, Salama is saying that, you know, how about we were mentioned like particularly, not in a general sense. Then she says, then the, the day I said this, that very day, and this is the beauty of Islam, that very day I was alerted that day by his call, the Prophet's call from the pulpit, and because they used to live very close to the uh, masjid, uh, the wives of the Prophet most of them, at that moment I was combing my hair, I gathered up my hair and went to one of the rooms of my house, I listened hard, I heard him saying on the pulpit, oh people, God says in his book, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the men who are obedient to God and the women who are obedient to God, the men who are truthful and the women who are truthful, the men who are per uh, persevering and patient and the women who are persevering, and so on and so forth. So this is a beautiful ayat uh, that is in uh, Surah Ahzab. Continuing on, there were other Sahabiyat. You had somebody like Fatima bint al Qais. She narrates the long hadith of Dajjal and Tamim Adari. It's literally so huge, it's a huge hadith with a lot of detail, and she's the one who narrates it. And that should tell you something about their memories. And she was so eager to learn that despite her recent bereavement, so she was widowed, and then she completed her iddat, which is uh, the three, three months. The moment it was over, she rushed to the masjid to listen to the sermon. That should tell you how eager they were to learn. It wasn't something which was burdensome they didn't feel that may maybe we don't want when you know we don't need to learn so much we can learn just the basics like you hear nowadays and good with the basics no they wanted to learn more and more refresh their memories more and more despite how their circumstances were you had uh, someone like uh, Hind bint Usaid al Ansariya she learned Surah Qaf from the Prophet Sallallahu recitation in prayer. This is phenomenal. Like he was reciting in prayer and she memorized that while he was reciting. So that tells you about their intellect, their uh, capacity to memorize. You had somebody like Shifa bint Abdullah, the Prophet ﷺ used to consult her uh, on economic matters. And because she was really good with business. And Umar in his ten tenure as the Caliph made her the health and safety executive of the Medina market. Now I want you to appreciate this. At that time, at the time of Umar Medina is like New York today, literally, like very influent, it's a very influential city. It's the capital, uh, capital city of uh, one of the strongest empire in the world at that time. And you have a woman controlling the market. You have the woman, the head of such a market. It's like somebody sort of being the head of Wall Street or something like that. And it wasn't because literally it wasn't really about the gender. It was more so about the skill. She had the skill, she could do it, she was given the job. And th that is something like, 
people's gender wasn't, uh, a, you know, a sort of a barrier for them to achieve their true potential uh, in, in a system, in the system of Islam, the system that Islam established. You had somebody like Rufaida al-Aslamiya, who was the first medic in Islam. She set uh, up a tent near the masjid, and that was that used to be called Rufaida's tent. And this used to be taken along in every battle. Now, quickly, the idea of a mobile hospitals with this, this was a mobile hospital. Uh, in the Muslim world, then this sort of evolved into fully, you know, full-fledged hospitals in all major cities of the Muslim world in the next few centuries. So because uh, Muslims became such experts at medicine uh, because of this, they actually literally, it, you, it could be called a medical revolution that was uh, heralded, that was literally sort of initiated by Muslims. And that's where you, you know, see uh, the initiation of this in Rufaida's tent, a female uh, medic in Medina. She used to train other men and women in this uh, field. And that is something that has been recognized by the historians of science. Uh, this is George Sarton, who's a historian of science in his book. He says that we have reason to believe that when during the Crusades, Europe at last began to establish hospitals, they were inspired by the Arabs of the Near East. The first uh, hospital in Paris was founded by Louis IX after his return from the Crusade of 1254. So uh, uh, Islam has been cre credited, the Islamic civilization has been credited with founding the first uh, hospitals as like separate inst uh, secular institutions for health, for healthcare. And that was, uh, that's what inspired now, you know, uh, the modern hospital. And I've, I've covered that in detail in many of my uh, videos and presentations. Here is a very interesting story. And I want you to, like, I want to sort of send the message across to people through, you know, using these small incidents in Islamic history so that we realize how were women treated how were their intellectual capacities appreciated and how important their roles were in the development of uh, the Islamic civilization and how all of that actually debunks and absolutely destroys much of what is said in our world today by Muslims, ignorant Muslims and uh, non-Muslims regarding the place and the status of women in Islam. So in Umar al-Awwam's time, this is the second caliph uh, of Islam, uh, due to the increase in resources, the dowry amount, the mahar that is given to uh, the women uh, for marriage, it became very, you know, exorbitant. So he wanted to fix it to 400 dirhams, putting aside the excess amount for the state treasury. So any man who gave anything more than 400 dirhams, uh, Umar al-Awwam, brought out this law that no, we are going to conf uh, confiscate that amount and put it uh, on, you know, put it for the state treasury because it's getting too expensive to get married and women are de demanding a bit too much, uh, which was contrary to the practice of the prophet during the prophet wasalam. So his whole sole intention was always the betterment of uh, the Muslims. He wanted to make marriage easy. What if it becomes too high and then it'll become difficult for some people? So that's what his intention was. And so he got out this law, literally a policy, let's say. And what happens is while he's doing this uh, in the masjid, he's discussing this and he's, you know, he's the leader. So he, his word is law, literally. So he says, we should do this. Anything above 400 dirhams, we need to take hold of that, put it in the state treasury. That's a bit too much uh, for Meher. And a woman got up and said, oh, Amir al the leader of the believers, is the book of God, the Quran to be followed or what you say? Now, Umar, of course, he said, of course, the book of Allah. The woman then said, you've just forbidden people from increasing the mahar, whereas God says in his book, all oh, believers, it is unlawful for you to force them, as in your wives, to give up a part of what you have given them. So basically, this is in relation to if a man gives a woman some amount, be it a lot 
or less for as meher, it's her property. You cannot take any part of it. Even the husband doesn't have any right to take it. Neither does the state have any right to take. It. And that is established by the uh, Quran. And you can see the intellectual acumen of, of uh, a woman uh, like that, of a Sahabia, uh, a Sahabia like that. I mean, she understood that, no, this is something that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not allowed. And then because Umar was so sincere and he was such a uh, righteous leader, he was like, indeed, the woman is right and Umar is wrong. He had the humility. This is one of the most powerful men of that time, leading the most powerful civilization of that time. And he has the humility to actually concede and say that, yes, you, the woman is right. He doesn't even know who the woman is. She must not be, and even in the Hadith literature, it's not mentioned what her name is. So she's not somebody, she's not Aisha, she's not somebody. It's, it's a woman people don't know. But this is one of the most intelligent men in, uh, amongst the Muslims at that time, conceding that, yes, he's made a mistake. She knows, she has said what is right. Why? Again and again, I want to prove the point. Because in Islam, the standard is the Quran. The standard is not the gender. The standard is not any other norm. If a woman knows the Quran more, she has the right to lead. She has the right to a sort of, you know, she has the appropriate skills that are required for whatever aspect that must be. Here it is, uh, you know, this particular social aspect. For whatever aspect, the thing is, that is what imparted the gender equality that we had in Islamic history. Continuing on, we see in the successive generations, also known as the Tabi'in, the rise of female scholarship. Uh, with every passing generation, what we notice, if we were to like construct a chart, we would see an increase in the number of uh, female scholars in every community. And that's what we're going to see, that the different religious sciences were developed in the following three to four centuries. So you had fiqh, you had a lot of hadith literature, and you had other uh, sciences like uh, sira and usul developed in these uh, formative three to four centuries. Uh, the presence of female scholarship kept on increasing till the colonial period. Literally, it's a graph that's upward, uh, you know, it goes upward with the presence of female scholars teaching uh, publicly in, mas in uh, Masajid, for example, the famous Hanabila Mosque uh, in Damascus, the other, uh, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus as well. You had the presence of female scholars teaching a mixed crowd, literally a mixed crowd of uh, uh, men and women, many a times uh, in their own homes as well. Women memorized the Quran, they nar narrated Hadith, they studied and memorized numerous books of Hadith, fiqh, grammar, usul, sirah. So all of this is religious sciences. Right now, we're talking more about the religious uh, knowledge. We're going to go into uh, what is today called the secular sciences, science, astronomy, uh, later on. But at that time, those were not considered secular. You have to understand that. That when we're talking about Islamic history, there is no sharp demarcation between, okay, these are religious sciences and those are secular sciences. Uh, that sharp demarcation only comes with uh, the Western uh, civilization. So all famous scholars had female teachers and they took narrations, ijazas from female scholars. So all, so uh, we've uh, talked about Dr. Akram Nadvi's and his book actually this is a monumental work that has been done by Dr. Nadvi. It's called uh, Al Muhaddisat and uh, the Women Scholars in Islam. It's a monumental 43 volume biographical dictionary which charts some of the significant contributions made by female Hadith scholars over the past 1400 years. He documents and you have to understand, this is over uh, a period of 1400 years. And uh, in this period, you've had like major destructions of uh, manuscripts. You had the Mongol invasion that destroyed some millions of manuscripts. You had the Spanish Inquisition that destroyed millions of manuscripts. So this is the remnants that, that we have of the manuscripts. And by studying those manuscripts, Dr. Nadvi has come 
to document and uh, the, the biographies of 10,000 female scholars of hadith, specifically of hadith. There has to be way more than this. I don't know how many uh, times more than this number, which is the actual number. This, this is all that he could find and which in itself is a huge number. 10,000 female scholars. And some of the names that I could get from uh, his, his uh, book, uh, which is a summary, the English book is a summary of the Arabic work, Al Muhaddisat, are these uh, great women scholars, many of whom he documents in his uh, book, wherein they educated, they, um, they educated very important male uh, scholars and other female scholars uh, in sometimes in public domains like uh, the great uh, Hanabila Mosque uh, in Damascus and the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus as well. This is his work, the monumental work, 43 volumes of just the names of female uh, scholars of Islam, 10,000 women. And some of the examples of the male imams that we had who uh, were taught by female teachers, Ibn Hazm, who is a great jurist from uh, Cordoba, was mainly educated by women. He'd, he had over 60 female teachers. I mean, that is so significant. Take any one of your contemporary scholar and ask him, how many female teachers do you have? Uh, I can uh, guarantee you it cannot be uh, more than this number. It has to be less than this number. And that should tell you how less this, this whole tradition, uh, so much of it has been deducted. Like you really had a very strong presence of female scholarship in the past, and now it has decreased. So we've actually regressed. In Islamic history, we've actually you know, like you say, whenever somebody says, oh, you're a seventh century, uh, you know, you're talking like a seventh century person, a medieval uh, kind of thinking that you have, but actually in the domain of Islam, with respect to Islam, the you know, the further you go in the past, the better it gets. It's actually way better for women in the past than it is now. You don't have 60 female teachers teaching this uh, great Imam. And then you have Imam Malik. He was the founder of the Maliki school. He educated his do daughter Fatima so well, uh, instead of his son, it said that, you know, he would compare the two and he would say, this is my son and this is my daughter. So I gave all my knowledge to my uh, daughter. She memorized the Muwatta, that was his uh, book, and uh, would uh, many a times correct her father's students in their narration. So what a narration, for those of you who don't know how Hadith is studied, is you literally sit with a sheikh uh, who has his book, like traditionally, and then you had to memorize all of what he's written, all of the Hadith, along with the chains of narration. And then the final exam would be that you sit near the sheikh Either you hear him speak and you compare your notes with him or you uh, narrate and you uh, you are made to compare your narration with his book. So that's what a narration means. It's like a final exam for Hadith uh, studies. Uh, Ibn Jawzi, uh, uh, yeah, the great uh, Hanbali scholar had over 70 female teachers. So that is remarkable, something that we don't even have in today's world with all of the internet. Travel has been made easy. Women's education is, you know, the topic of the day always. Uh, Muslim women need to be educated. Muslim women were so educated, you know, with the current affairs in Afghanistan and people talking about, uh, you know, how um, women need to be educated and women need to work and all of that. Actually, when you go back in Islamic history, you see women literally far, far, far ahead, even as compared to their Western uh, contemporaries. Yes. And uh, the enormous contributions of female Hadith narrators debunks, like I said, I said it before as well, that it debunks the Islamophobic and the ignorant accusation that in, in, in Islam, women are equal to half a man intellectually or have defective intellects. It's, it's very unfortunate that some ignorant Muslims go about quoting a Hadith 
decontextualized and they are in no way you know qualified to say something like that and they take for example the ayat of the quran that talks about testimony and that is a testimony in a specific domain related to a finance matter wherein women usually are not involved fair enough it's not really about the gender it's about the skill and the employer uh, you know uh, involvement if i'm not involved in let's say i don't know anything about stock exchange i cannot be taken as a witness but i know something about science let's say and i must be taken as so it's not really about the gender it's about your skill and your expertise and similarly you have many ignorant muslims and then islamophobes also taking the hadith out of context but uh, which talks about women and their so-called defective intellects that's talking about a specific kind of uh you know a person it's not really about women uh, so much uh, there are many uh, ayat of the quran that talk about a man who's uh, you know thrown into hell and what he says like for example in surah mulk he says i wish i had used my intellect that means this was a very intellectually dim person being thrown into hell fire a, a, and the tense uh, you know this um, the gender is masculine what uh, what i mean to say is that with the example of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam consulting his wives and other female companions with the example of the uh, senior sahaba consulting uh female uh, sahabia the sahabiyat uh, in medina with the example of scholars taking from female narrators what we understand is that they didn't understand that hadith that way they didn't act on it they were taking advice from, from uh, female scholars and their female contemporaries and uh, the first story that i uh, started my talk with with amra bin abdul rahman i mean this is the perfect example to show you that a woman's opinion was conclusive because it was not really about the gender it was about again and again it was about the expertise the skill if you have the skill whether you're a man or a woman it's irrelevant and that's what they understood very well and something we need to understand too so i want to cover uh, briefly the example extraordinary uh, life of one of the female scholars of the latter generations fatima bin sa'd al khair so her father was a scholar and most of the time when you study these uh, women scholars religious scholars uh, even uh, the so called secular scholars astronomers mathematicians most of the time they come from a family of scholars and either their father or their grandfather their grandmother those are scholars and that's what it's in the family it's in the blood so he uh, the father of fatima bin sa'd al khair which was uh, sa'd al khair he spent a lot of money and attention to the education of his daughters it said that he only had daughters he uh, didn't have uh, sons uh, and what he did was most of her studies were done while she was traveling and before her marriage she was a very young uh, woman and she traveled and, and i'm going to show you how much she traveled and this was done while uh, and um, she studied extensively through her traveling and just for seeking knowledge she traveled so much and i'm going to show you how much she traveled so she was originally from china even though she, uh, it it said her father was from valencia uh, but she, then they shifted to china kashgar you know uh, nowadays we talk about the uyghur muslims uh, so that particular area kashgar uh, is a particular area in uh, xinjiang region or the turkestan region so they lived there and they traveled traveled all the way to north africa in search of knowledge this young woman unmarried then after she settled she st settled in cairo she uh, got married to a man who was 14 year years younger than her another scholar 14 years younger than her so uh, settled in cairo where students then used to flock to her from different parts of the muslim world and this is the map of how much she traveled so if you can see she starts from kashgar which is on the right side 
She goes all the way from Samarkand to Central Asia, Bukhara, Merv, uh, Tus, which is in Iran, Nishapur, again in Iran, Ray, uh, Isfahan, again in Iran, then Ira, she goes to Baghdad. From Baghdad, she stays in Baghdad for some time. She goes to different cities of uh, Iraq, modern day Iraq, Mosul and Kufa. Then from there, she goes to Syria, Damascus, and then other cities of uh, Bilad al-Sham, it used to be called. So, uh, Nablus and Jerusalem, Beirut, uh, and then to Tunis, then to Cairo. So she's going to Africa, then a little bit uh, in the south uh, to Africa. Also, it's said that she uh, may have gone to Constantinople as uh, north as Constantinople, which is, uh, you know, um, Turkey, modern day Turkey. So even uh, today, I don't know of any uh, female scholar who has, with all of the amenities that we have, uh, with travel and all of that, to travel so much on camelback, horseback, just to learn, just to seek knowledge. A woman, not married, uh, single, uh, maybe accompanied by her uh, father, and the father was very enthusiastic about her seeking knowledge. And then after getting all of that knowledge, then she sits in Cairo, gets married to uh, somebody who's 14 years younger than her, and then teaches. People flock to her from the all the parts of the Muslim world. So this is extraordinary. This is back in the you know 10th century. Imagine that. And of course, we are uh, no. Now it's, it wasn't really about just the intellectual bit, memorization, and all of that. It was also there were women who internalized Islam, and uh, they uh, worked on the spiritual sciences as well. So we have the best example in uh, Rabia al Basri, uh, who is literally the founder, uh, or you could say, you know, somebody who set forth the doctrine of divine love. She's been credited with that. And what is that doctrine? As in, you see. Seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you attain his nearness through zuhud, you know, asceticism and all of that. That's that's Islamic spirituality, al ihsan uh, good deeds and worship. Um, this must be the supreme goal to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is high above the pursuit of paradise and its delights. So, for example, at, uh, we have this notion uh, of, of, you know, we need to save ourselves from the hellfire and we need to attain paradise. Rabi al-Basri's view was that, no, 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 let's not be at that level. Let's just be good and do good deeds primarily and solely for the love of God, literally for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be our uh, core focus and goal in life. Not really the material, you know, as the, the delights of paradise and to seek refuge from hellfire. So that's a level high. That's like, you know, deep love uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she's credited with that. Moving on, slowly and slowly, we are moving to uh, a, a different domain. Now, we talked about how religious sciences were developed. Those were the first ones to, to be developed. And then this concept of gaining more and more knowledge. So moving from uh, strict religious sciences to philosophy, okay, the rational sciences to Kalam or theology. And then from there to science, to practical science like astronomy. How do you calculate the prayer? How do you calculate the Qibla? This needs a lot of understanding of uh, astronomy as well as uh, mathematics, geography, uh, and all of that. And then other sciences. So we see the world's first university. Hold on. The world's first university was actually established by a Muslim woman. Okay. Let's let that sink in. Here you have a Muslim woman so liberated, uh, to use that word, so emancipated and so focused and so, uh, you know, revitalized by uh, the, you know, the, the importance that uh, Islam gives to the seeking of knowledge that she actually established the first uh, university and it's still functioning. 
it is still functional in Fez, Morocco. Uh, firstly, she established this as a masjid, which also had a learning institute along with her. Her father had left her and her sister a huge inheritance, which both these sisters utilized. Uh, this, the other sister also built a mosque and her uh, Fatima al Fehri, she um, established this university. And you know, it's so um, almost, I would say it's, it's just appalling that this idea of uh, a Muslim woman establishing a the world's first university is so i would say unpalatable to western academia some some few of uh, western academics that they literally uh, you read some of their com comments they literally bend over their backs to actually deny this this uh, the veracity of this uh, claim by saying that you know uh, the store the story is a bit too good to be true. How could two sisters then establish two masjids or someone who says, uh, I heard uh, one uh, Western historian actually deny this just on the basis that he said, no, it was just a mosque. And later on, it turned into a university, not really done by Fatima al fahri but done by uh, a ruler. But actually the Western academic does not understand a basic principle, a basic uh, you know, characteristic of the Islamic, civilization till today you do not have a masjid except that it also serves as an educational institute there is no masjid even a tiny masjid on the street after 1400 years even a tiny masjid on the street will have some sort of education uh, be between the salawat you'll have some you know um uh, children uh, uh, sitting in gatherings and learning the Quran or uh, learning how to read the Quran, memorizing the Quran. So a masjid is essentially in Islam a an educational institute. So we cannot deny the fact that she established a masjid and that that masjid was an educational institute. So all of these doubts that mostly Western academics raise uh, are just based on, I really feel their Islamophobia and the fact that they find very unbelievable that a Muslim woman should be so liberated to actually establish the world's first university. Why? Because women, in the Western world weren't even allowed to step into a university, literally. They weren't even allowed, and we all also know this, that there were no universities in the West uh, until Muslims uh, opened a university. The first university in Europe was in uh, Salerno in uh, uh, Italy. It was actually established by Muslims. And then the idea of higher learning and higher education degrees and, you know, PhDs and all of that uh, was, was developed in the West, but it was by uh, Muslims living in uh, Al Andalus and on the borders with uh, Europe. And even when these universities were developed, women were not even allowed to step in until 1821. And they had to fight for it. It wasn't something that was given to them. Yes, women need to be educated. No, they had to literally dare to step in. So you had one, you know, uh, one woman, uh, you know, uh, uh, forcefully sort of uh, getting an admission or another woman forcefully then uh, getting an admission in any other college. And then they had to fight again to become educators in university. So I do understand the sentiment of certain Western academics when they just can't accept the fact that a Muslim woman actually could historically establish the first university in the world when what they know of their history is, well, darkness as uh, we know it. So uh, religious sciences along with mathematics, geography, astronomy, and medicine were taught in this university. And uh, we know it historically that all of these subjects along with uh, religious sciences, of course, were taught. And this was a practice in the Islamic world that from the very early on, uh, you had religious sciences then being coupled with a little bit of logic, a little bit of mathematics, a tiny bit of anatomy, which is required even to study fiqh, you need to know some bit of the human body. Female astronomers in Islam. Now keep in mind 
that uh, you know it, it always helps sometimes to make a comparison we just talked about how western women weren't even allowed to step into universities till like yesterday literally 1800s is like yesterday uh, and at least 1000 years before that you had women astronomers in islam and two of uh, the you know famous figures that i could find uh, are maryam al astrolabia uh, she was an expert in astronomy and man manufacturing astrolabes so that's where you see her name her father was actually uh, in this field of manufacturing astrolabes and it's very difficult i've seen how they used to make it basically uh, an astrolabe is like a classical computer that computes uh, the movement of the stars so you uh, sort of trace the movement of the stars using that uh, if you can see on the screen the golden globe thing uh, throughout the year and then you draw it up on a uh, you know a flat disc uh, of metal and so that you know throughout the year the stars move in such a tra tra trajectory it helps you calculate then the seasons the start and the end of seasons uh, the lunar months uh, and other things uh, astronomical um, calculations and what's interesting uh, what i found is that she lived a very brief life uh, at the age of 23 she passed away but imagine uh, the kind of work she must have done in these 23 years that that was enough to make her famous she's actually pretty famous in astronomy and just 23 years you can make a mark in history that like 1000 years after we are reading about you that must tell you something about this phenomenal amazing woman and then you have somebody like Fatima al Majliti, again, a daughter of the famous astronomer. She was a daughter of famous astronomer from uh, Al Andalus. Uh, and she was an expert in astronomical calculations. Again, this is really, it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's not simple. It's very sophisticated mathematics that you had to use even back then. And they were doing this sophisticated ma mathematical calculations by hand, no calculators only mind and you had female mathematicians in islam you had somebody uh, known as lubna from cordoba she was a mathematician she was well known for her knowledge in solving complex geometry and algebra problems uh, understanding this that you know muslims have worked really really well in developing uh, arithmetic and mathematics in general. The word algebra is actually from a Muslim uh, mathematician's textbook called Al-Jabr, uh, Wal Muqabala, uh, that is Al Khawarizmi's book. And uh, women as well as men were like really good with mathematics. And this is at a time when in Europe, uh, you had a, a, a famous pope saying that mathematics is from the devil. Uh, they used to call it Muslim mathematics, Muslim sciences, these are from the devil. So you had women uh, excelling in mathematics. Suteta al-Mahamli, a very important expert in algebraic equations and inheritance formulae, and this is very significant. They used to use uh, algebra to solve inheritance distribution. So for example, how do you calculate uh, what the mother gets or what the daughters get or what the son gets they would put in a particular equation and that's how they used to derive each and everybody's share and because of this she was an expert consultant and witness in courts to solve inheritance and financial cases so you have cases regarding you know uh, discrepancies in inheritance or financial transactions what the judge would do is call Sudeta al Mahamali and she would use her mathematical calculations to uh, decide what is, uh, you know, what, what is the actual solution to the problem. And famous Islamic scholars such as Ibn Kathir, Ibn Khatib al Baghdadi, and uh, Ibn al Qayyim reference her work and praise her because of this. So she was pretty famous, both of these uh, female mathematicians.
Female leaders in Islam, and we've heard this again, uh, again a misconception about uh, women and leadership. We are actually going to see something uh, on those lines. Zubaydah bint Mansur, she was the wife of Harun al-Rashid, the famous Abbasid Caliph. She built the Baghdad Mecca highway. So from Baghdad, she built a highway till Mecca. She acted as a civil engineer. So she, this was her philanthropic work. She funded it. And then she also acted as a civil engineer. She had great knowledge of this back in the day. We're talking about the 10th century and introduced the concept of service stations on highways. And can, can you imagine that back in that century, a thousand years back, you have the concept of service station that we have today in modern, um, you know, uh, highways. So medieval engineer, it was literally a medieval engineering marvel. And this is something that you still see. They've left the trail there. I mean, with a, a proper tour guide, you will be able to see from Baghdad till uh, Mecca. It was a medieval engineering marvel with with outstanding roads along with the restrooms at points. So like we talked about the service stations, she's the one who introduced this concept. So it had, you know, uh, these restrooms with uh, even those, you know, uh, uh, hotels of some sort, accommodation and, uh, you know, water supply uh, and other things that are required uh, 1000 years back. Then along with that road, because Mecca at that time didn't have water, uh, what she did was she built a canal with aquifers, underground resources, but, you know, 1000 years back, which served the pilgrims for over 1000 years. Uh, I've seen that when uh, I went for Umrah, it's called Nehre Zubeda or the Zubeda can Canal. And uh, it's just amazing. It's literally uh, an engineering marvel. How uh, it's said that she was such a pious woman that when uh, you know she told her uh, sort of contractors that don't you know don't do any sort of uh, there shouldn't be any uh, you know uh, miserliness in this project. I am willing to pay even a dinar. A dinar is a gold coin. Uh, I think 10 grams gold coin. Uh, I, she said, I'm willing to pay a dinar for every axe strike. One dinar, two dinar, three dinar, uh, for uh, to build all of this. Because she saw it as a religious, of course, a religious uh, obligation, a religious uh, rewardable deed. And that is also important when she was, after it was completed, she was presented with uh, the accounting books uh, to see how much she, she spent because she did it out of her own pocket. She was a philanthropist. Uh, it said that she threw the books in the uh, river Tigris and said, this is not the time for accounting. The accounting will be done in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. So this was this was kind of mentality these people had, which is so brilliant. Then we move on to somebody who is even more extraordinary. Now we all know about Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi and how he defeated the Crusaders, how he took back Jerusalem. But the Crusaders didn't stop there. They didn't stop after him. They continued their attacks and their, uh, you know, uh, their problems that they uh, made in the Muslim world. And you had a woman uh, leader, uh, she was the queen uh, of Egypt at that time. And she defeated the seventh crusade. And it was such a, uh, you know, it was such a military victory that she captured the king of France, Louis the Ninth. I mean, that is just extraordinary. And she was referred to as Malikat al-Muslimin, the queen of the Muslims. She, uh, her, her husband was the king of Egypt <clears throat> and he was martyred in this battle. That's when she took over and that's when she defeated them. And this is even, you know, more extraordinary than any other, um, you know, military expedition that we learn about. But we don't know her name so much. Shajarat al-Dur. 
and beautifully expressed by Professor Salim al Hassani, who said that women in Islamic history actively participated in education, agriculture, textile, industry, science, medicine, management, and administration, in addition of being mothers of the other half of society. It's really incredible how they could manage this. We have to understand these are women who are married, they have their children, they have their families, they're not women who are, uh, you know, uh, ignoring the duties that are due on them as fe uh, the female servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In addition to all of that, they're doing these amazing things. And this, this whole idea that is somehow being pushed around that either you're a holy woman or you're a careerist, you know, you don't really care about your home and your family and this and that. That was literally not true. Uh, Muslim women of the past destroyed that uh, the, destroy that notion completely because we see all of them are married, they have children, they have their families, they have many a times uh, both husband, husband and wife are experts in a particular field, be it religious or secular. And, and they're doing, you know, they're just, they have best of both the worlds. And then he uh, says that the real secret weapon of the Muslim civilization, what made the Muslim civilization so great was not men. Men were just on the front lines, which is true. They were, you know, the visible part of what made uh, the Islamic civilization great. It was Muslim women who held the society together and propagated Islam everywhere. The contribution of women who trained young men and women with the objectives of Islam is the key to the greatness of the Muslim civilization. This now we want to talk about the actual crux of uh, the presentation, which is we've talked about the past. We've talked about how it was so uh, glorious, how women were so involved, how women were at the forefront of the development of the different sciences, be it religious or, uh, as we know, secular. They didn't see a difference between religion and secular because as long as it's ill and as long as you can benefit uh, the Muslim society or the world as a whole, or you can improve the quality of life of people, that is sacred. So if astronomy is sought to ease uh, your, uh, you know, your need for prayer and the fact that you can calculate your Qibla and your prayer times, there's nothing secular about astronomy then. It's a sacred science. And the same can be said about how mathematics was developed to calculate inheritance amounts and other business transactions. That made it uh, sacred. But now with keeping all of that in mind, Let's talk about the time that we are in, the here and the now, the, the, you know, the effort to bring about an Islamic revival. This is something that we all must be necessarily a part of, and which is the construction of a world order with political, economic, social, educational, and religious institutions that will collectively produce an environment conducive to the spiritual and worldly growth of Muslims. So this is my, my definition of an Islamic revival. Islam is not a religion. Islam is a way of life. So there is a political aspect of Islam. It's not political Islam. It is Islam. There is an economic part of Islam. There is an, a social aspect of Islam. And then there is a spiritual aspect of Islam. All of this is Islam. And if we can sort of reconstruct all of these institutions and these different aspects, what we would have is an environment that would be conducive to our spiritual and our worldly growth, our growth in the dunya as well as the hereafter. That is something that we all need to work towards. And that is something which has been prophesied by the Prophet through various hadiths of the end times. And that's what uh, we're going to be talking about. So uh, another 
the definition would be a reconstruction, a renovation, restoration of the house of Islam. There are lots of things that we are lacking in. There are lots of things that need uh, a repair in. We are really behind, the, as we can see, even if we just take just this one thing, education of women, the presence of female scholarship, we can say that, yeah, this time today, 21st century, we don't have what the women of 9th century had. They were at the forefront of education and uh, you know, the intellectual growth of the society. You don't have that anymore uh, in the Muslim world. We need to revive that. And that all will be a part of the Islamic revival, a renovation, a restoration of the house of Islam, thereby making the attainment of the ultimate success for all members of the Ummah easy. That's the goal. It's not really about, you know, we need to do this just because we need to compete with the Western civilization or we need to compete with somebody else. No, we need an Islamic revival because we need a better atmosphere, a better environment for our spiritual growth, for uh, to attain our, uh, you know, true potential as a Muslim, as a member of this Ummah. That is required on a collective level. And then the question is, are we promised a global Islamic revival? So, you know, if that would give us a bit of, you know, uh, the, the push that we need, uh, sort of an encouragement if the Prophet said, yes, you're going to get it, work towards it. And he said it when he said, we have the opportunity to be equal to the first generation of uh, Muslims, the Sahaba. Try to understand that when you have the you know, opportunity to actually reach that high level, we know that the Sahaba are the best of Muslims. But if, for example, let's say you're given the opportunity to be on their level, that, that, that's phenomenal. That's amazing. And that's what this hadith says. The Prophet says, my ummah is like rain. I do not know which shower is better, the first or the last. So just you know the way the first generation has been uh, you know called the best the better one this in the same language the last generation is has also be, been equated with that and we have the opportunity to be part of this shower of rain and here we have a confirmation from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is he who sent, Allah who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religions, although those who associate with others, associate others with Allah dislike it. So, uh, uh, so deen, it's about the deen, it's Islam as a deen, as a way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan and destiny for the world, for creation, that the deen that he has sent with his messenger will be superior and will be uh, made to manifest, will be made to dominate over all other ways of life. So, for example, we have something known as the contemporary way of life, contemporary way of the modern way of life. So we are being told that your deen, your way of life is going to be raised up and for everyone to see that it was the highest and the best way of life. And that is a thing uh, that has been guaranteed. And that is what we have called an Islamic revival for all the world to see. They will see that Indeed, the Quran was the truth. And this is before the end of creation, but in the latter days. And we are in the latter days, the uh, end times. Then there's also a hadith that says that prophethood would remain as long as Allah wills it to be. Then he'll remove it. Then uh, when he wills, then there'll be khilafah on the prophetic method. So it's there's prophethood. Then there's khilafah. So this, the scholars say, these are the Khilafa Rashidun, Khulafa Rashidun, which are Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Umar radiallahu an, um, and uh, Usman radiallahu an, Ali radiallahu an, these four, and also some scholars add uh, Umar bin Abdulaziz uh, radiallahu an, and um, 
He says, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will remove it. And there'll be biting rule, malakan adam, and very like oppressive rule. Uh, and that is monarchy. And that, that's the time that we had empires, all of these different empires, the Abbasids and the uh, Umayyads and the Abbasids and the Mamluks and the Ottomans for as long as Allah wills. Then he'll remove it when he wills and there'll be oppressive rule. Mulkan Jabariya. And this is, uh, well, from there, when you end the, uh, you know, uh, monarchical rule, what do you have? Democracy. You have the nation state. So in the language of the Prophet وسلم, it's not really the government of the people, for the people, by the people, but it's oppressive rule. Mulkan Jabariya. For as long as uh, Allah wills, then he will remove it. Okay, so right now we are in a phase where there are nation states and so-called democracies uh, throughout the Muslim world. Then he will remove it and when he, when he wills and there will be khilafa upon the prophetic method. Again, a full circle and a khilafa again based on the prophetic method. And this has to be global. It cannot be national or uh, you know uh, confined to a particular region because whenever you have a khilafa it combines the whole uh, ummah so it would literally be a global khilafa the first time in islamic history you would be uh, you would be having something like that so this is also a confirmation of the islamic revival and Again, lastly, I heard the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, a group of people from my ummah will continue to fight in defense of truth and remain triumphant until the day of judgment. So these are people who are working towards the revival, the re restoration, the revivification of Islam, and they are going to be triumphant. They will be victorious. So, in conclusion, because we're still studying of what it means to have an Islamic revival, the generations leading up to the time of Imam Mahdi and Nabi Isa alayhi salam, these generations are going to witness the revival. The generation of Muslims already prepared. They are a generation of Muslims already prepared to identify, welcome and support them. The, uh, because we have a misconception, we say, yes, yes, it's going to happen. And that's the time of uh, Isa alayhi salam and Imam Mahdi. Most uh, probably they are, of course, going to be contemporaneous. But actually, the thing is, if we learn, the, uh, if we read all of these hadiths related to them, we see that a generation is already prepared intellectually, religiously, spiritually, already prepared uh, to welcome them. Uh, and uh, to support them and to establish this global khilafah and uh, the Islamic revival as we are talking about it. This is the time of, and it's it's not really the beginning. The time of Isa uh, alayhi salam and Imam Mahdi is not the beginning of this glorious period. Instead, it's the pinnacle of this spiritual revolution. So the work starts much before, and then it reaches this uh, high uh, position. So uh, the analogy would be of the winds and the thunder before the actual rain shower. You have, uh, you know, uh, the bearers of glad tidings uh, before the actual event uh, occurs. So briefly, if I could go, the problem today is now let's get realistic, is that we have a crisis in the Ummah and the crisis is multi-dimensional. There's a political crisis. Uh, that you have oppression in the Muslim Ummah, be, uh, be it, uh, you know, uh, with the diaspora or people living in the Muslim world. You have a, a political system that has been forcefully put in place, which is not Islamic and it is oppressive. Like we uh, said, it is Mulkan Jabariya, it's oppressive rule. And there are various ways that I can explain how it's oppressive rule because you are subjected to the sovereignty of uh, the United Nations and the United Nations is just five countries, uh, the US, UK, France, uh, and um, uh, Russia and China, and those are the ones who decide everything. You can never really go against what they have to do. That's oppression. And then you have uh, an economic crisis. Then you have a global economic system that has been put in place. It's interest-based 
haram and it is oppressive it is you know it's it's the number one reason of the enslavement of people including muslim nations the thing is indonesia africa india pakistan these are not poor countries these are resource rich countries they don't have lazy people the people in these countries also work very hard oftentimes even more than uh, how, you know the way americans or westerners work but why are they poor and why are those rich that is because the system that is governing the economy of the world literally is biased towards it's designed such that there are slaves and their slave masters and uh, then uh, you have a social crisis again materialism there's abuse against women uh, the social evils there's uh, this, this breakdown of the family unit that's promoted by western femini feminism it's an ideology that is uh, toxic in some ways and we have to understand that most of what uh, western feminism has to offer uh, the the good parts of it, the brighter parts of it, which is, let's say, uh, equal opportunities for all, education for all, uh, gender equality, equality in marriage, equality, in, you know, all of those things actually can be found in uh, Islam. And then there are the toxic parts, and may Allah save us from that, but you, uh, we need to understand these things because it's very important. Then there's a spiritual crisis, of course, when you have a society that is consumerist, that is materialist, that's going to literally kill spirituality. Uh, net, something as trivial as Netflix can literally slaughter our spirituality. And uh, the fact that, uh, you know, irreligion and skepticism is on the rise. There's an epistemological or an intellectual crisis. And uh, in epistemological means uh, related to knowledge. So as a religious tradition, we know that knowledge uh, can come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a, a non-physical source. But today, the way education is uh, done in uh, secular institutes throughout the world is that no, knowledge can only come from the world of matter, phys the physical world. There's nothing like revelation that comes from high above, uh, which is immaterial. So this is a crisis. It's a big challenge. And what they're saying is just an assumption. There is no proof. There is nothing to prove that. That's actually based on their own uh, opinions. And that can be, of course, uh, you know, uh, destroyed and debunked very easily. But then it is a crisis. It is a problem. And uh, then you will have a crisis, therefore, in education. Education is secularized. Remember that I said in the Muslim world, there was no sharp demarcation between science and pseudoscience, uh, you know, uh, non-science or uh, science and secular, uh, you know, religious sciences and secular sciences, because everything that has benefit, uh, everything that adds value uh, to a person was sacred. Uh, and that was the beauty of Islam. But now they have secularized education. We are all products of secular education. Why? Because uh, God has been completely removed from the curriculum. Uh, when you study science, you are not told that it is God who is behind all of this complexity and this beauty and this structure. No, no, no. What you are indoctrinated with, which is again an assumption, it's a conjecture, there is no proof for it, and which is what they push forward to our children, to ourselves when, whenever we study science, uh, is that these are all natural laws. So the universe uh, functions naturally by its own self, own self. There's nothing outside the system. And that is shirk. That is actually shirk. It's kufr. Uh, and history also is taught in this particular manner, wherein you're not, in, in Islam we are said, we are told uh, that his, the historical process is actually a moral process. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly in control of uh, civilizations and the, the rise and fall of civilizations and how history progresses. You don't study that in, uh, in your uh, school because it's just a random uh, mix of events. 
kings fight, kings die, uh, empires come and empires go. There's nothing about, you know, they were oppressive and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. Or they were uh, terrible and that's why they were, you know, uh, destroyed. And all of that is a, a teleological, it's called a teleological or a moral perspective on history, which is completely missing. Uh, thus, the, a degree is just a consumer product. And then on top of that, when if, if this wasn't enough, we have the media onslaught that's pushing the consumerist, the naturalist uh, agenda of how all you need is the dunya and all your questions can be answered by the dunya and there is nothing outside the dunya. This is a crisis, brothers and sisters. This is a serious uh, crisis. And an Islamic revival is impossible unless and until we deal with this crisis. The question is who and what is going to help us deal with the crisis? And the topic uh, for today is what is the role of Muslim women in such a scenario. We did talk about how women were at the forefront of all uh, activity in uh, the formative years of Islam and even the succeeding, um, you know, the successive um, centuries of Islam. So from that, it follows that women need to be at the center of this work and this effort for the Islamic revival and dealing with these challenges. So you have, now the beauty about a woman, the beauty about Muslim women being at the forefront of this, uh, I'm just talking about, you know, a, a theoretical uh, situation. Right now, I'm not really talking about who all are. The fact is that even the men are very few in this field. The people who are actually dealing with the crisis on the ground are very few when it comes to men also, and hardly any women, literally. And that is a, the biggest crisis. But I'm here with a positive message. And uh, the positive message is that imagine you had a good you know, number of Muslim women trained to deal with all of these challenges, spiritual challenges, social challenges, economic challenges, political challenges, the growing extremism, the academic challenges, scientific challenges. And along with dealing with these challenges, which even uh, men can do, uh, Muslim men can do, there would be an additional advantage with a Muslim woman, and that would be the presence of a woman dealing with all of these challenges would in itself, without, with a, without her even saying a word, it would decimate and destroy the propaganda against Muslim women, that Muslim women are dumb, they're oppressed, they are treated really badly, and Islam is an anti-woman religion, and that is why uh, the presence of Muslim women is so important that it's going to serve two benefits, whether a scholar or just a seeker of knowledge, whether up at the high intellectual level or just at the basic uh, level of understanding what the crisis is and then dealing with it would serve two purposes, that you're actually solving the crisis and along with that, you're destroying the propaganda that uh, has uh, been going on against Muslim women, especially when it comes to our practice of our religion, the hijab, uh, the status of women, and all of that, which is very, very important, something that no man can do. You know, you have a Muslim men talking about how Islam is liberative and how it's emancipatory, how it doesn't oppress women and all of that. And that's fine. That's great. But then it it's not as impactful as the fact that you would have a Muslim woman out of her own personal experience saying how it is really uh, all uh, that is said in the media in uh, other circles is nothing more than propaganda. And not only just dealing with that, then moving on and taking on another challenge from uh, the current world order, let's say an economic challenge, uh, you know, deconstructing how the economic system is oppressive. Uh, 
or a social challenge or a scientific challenge, deconstructing how uh, science when studied in a proper framework can bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of these atheists who are using science as uh, their hand uh, you know, tool are just doing so because they are, you know, they have some very strong assumptions and conjectures which are completely unwarranted. That is completely your way of looking at the world. That's not what the science is saying. So these are very important things. And uh, a few ayat that talk about this, which I find so beautiful in Surah Saf, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he loves those who fight in his cause in a row as though they are a single structure joined firmly, like a wall. Now, uh, keep in mind how a wall is. A wall is constructed out of bricks. Many a times you have a tiny place that, that you can fit in a tiny brick and everything just... Uh, you know, uh, sort of strengthens the other. It's all about the strength. So uh, the material, the concrete material strengthens all of the bricks. And it's not really, you know, everybody has a place in the wall. The big brick has a place in the wall and the tiny brick has a, a place in the wall. The cement has the play, uh, a place, a very important role to play in the wall. No one's role is insignificant. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us that be like that strong structure when you're working in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, working for his deen, work like a wall, a structure. And that would require us to think, okay, where do I fit? What are my strengths? Where can I, uh, you know, put my strengths to use for the sake of my religion, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because that's how our role models in the past, the, you know, many examples that I gave, those were people, those were women who had uh, their, uh, you know, uh, daily work, their house, their household, their children, their husband, and this and that. But they weren't satisfied with just that. This whole propaganda of, you know, how women need to just be at home, and if they obey their husband, then that's that's their ticket to paradise. And that's true. And that uh, we agree, we are people of family. With uh, The ummah is constructed out of smaller units. Those are family. And the woman is a central pillar of that family, holding that family family together. There's nothing to belittle in that role. There's nothing to reject in that. But that is not all. If there are women who have more potential, and I've given you so many examples of women who have so much more potential that they could accomplish that, and they were good at that, and then they moved on and served their deen through their potential, and they reached those high levels, uh, those lofty status that they had because they had the potential. If you have the potential, why not? Go ahead, do this. There is nobody who can limit your potential. You, you need to raise the bar for your own self. And there is no one who can tell you that, oh, sister, you don't need to do this. You just need to do that. You can tell this person, I know what I have to do. I know what my potential. If my prophet, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my prophet have uh, given me this open field to work in, they've given me the potential to do so, why should I not utilize that potential? Why should I not work towards it? This deen needs me and I need this deen. I need to uh, accomplish something. I need to, and there is this, there will never be enough, literally. We have so much crisis. It's not the time to actually discuss that, you know, you stay at the back we'll handle it because there's nobody who's handling this. We are in a state of a crisis and there is nobody who's handling this. Hardly, literally, I can count on my fingers the people who are at the forefront dealing with the crisis. We are being told that there is no place for Islam. We are being told that Islam doesn't belong to the 21st century. It's a 7th century ideology. Islam. Who, how many people can you count in your uh, on your hand who are actually dealing with something like that? And how many people can you count who are dealing with that in different languages? Like, uh, you know, because this is now global um, propaganda, an attack on Islam. It's an ideological attack. And there are different variants of this attack. It could be a scientific attack, as in science has proved there's no God. What rubbish. 
Who's going to prove that that's rubbish? Who's going to do that? This requires a scientific mind and a, philosoph a philosophical mind as well. Hardly a few people are dealing with this. And there are no women. I mean, when you have very less men and you have no women, what that means is that we all need to find a place of what, what problem can I solve? Now it's not the time to say that, you know, uh, you don't need to do this or you don't need to do this or that. Now it's the time to say, where can I volunteer? Where can I solve this problem? And that's how the Sahabiyat were. The Prophet ﷺ didn't call people, you know, or didn't give them anything. They had not, they were all volunteers. The Prophet ﷺ himself was a volunteer. It was all about, okay, what can I do more? You know, you understand, we need to be like that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this qital here to fight in his cause is not really, you know, the physical fight. Because in the Quran, we are told again and again, there is an intellectual war against Islam and be aware of that. That's the most dangerous one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Furqan, and uh, do not obey the disbelievers, the ones who have rejected the truth and strive against them with it, with what? With the Quran. So this is the ideological jihad. This is the ideological uh, you know, defense against the ideological attack on Islam. And you have the Quran to fight it. You can't really fight with the Quran a combat, like physical combat. So this is the a battle of ideas. When you're being told that your religion does not belong to the 21st century, that is an attack, an ideological attack on our religion. When you're being told that you're oppressed and you're treated as uh, somebody who is of a lesser intellect. Uh, that is an attack on our religion or on ourselves. And we have the duty to deal with it. And the first step of dealing with it is seeking knowledge. So it starts with knowledge. It's all about knowledge and it ends with more knowledge. That is why the need of the hour is literally a plethora of, of, of new careers and females volunteering developing these new fields because like I said you're going to be solving two problems you're going to be uh, solving the crisis and then you're also just by virtue of you being you you're going to actually can uh, make people see that yes this is an emancipated woman a religious Muslim and emancipated hence Islam does not do that that's all propaganda and that's all biased uh, you know uh, uh, opinion about Islam an agenda against Islam. We need female thinkers. We need female policy makers in, in Muslim uh, countries, at least, or in other countries that steer the policy of a state, of an organization towards the betterment of society, towards the betterment of, of, uh, of people, of all people. That is Islam. Uh, we need, and that's what the Sahabiyat were doing. Uh, that's what uh, the Tabe uh, art were doing, and that's what the successive generations. You see, nobody uh, told Fatima al Fihri or uh, uh, what's her name, Shajarat al Dur, uh, to do that. Nobody paid them. They got up and they did it themselves because they felt so strongly about it. And they did it for the sake of Islam, they did it for the sake of Allah. We need female judges and theologians who would interpret the religion like they did in the past in a way which is holistic. Many a times we are biased just because of our particular uh, you know, uh, temporal setup or our ethnicity or, uh, or our education or even our gender. We need a, you know, sort of like both the genders interpreting this beautiful religion just the way. This is not something which is modernist or revisionist or new. This is how it used to be in the seventh century during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after him. We need to revive that. So children's books, authors, one of the biggest challenges for parents today is how do you, what clean uh, literature can you give to your child? Uh, they're being subjected, even at the school is not safe with REC and I hear all of that propaganda of teaching the children, all of that, you know, uh, nonsense about uh, LGBT and the neutrality and all of that. We need 
female curriculum developers, female children's books authors, uh, so that they don't read, they don't have to read Harry Potter, they don't have to read, uh, you know, all of those books that they're there. Uh, they don't have to watch those cartoons, we would have enough of our own uh, media, fiction, Yes, there used to be fiction. Uh, I've, I've heard a beautiful lecture on how Muslims were uh, the first to develop sci-fi fiction. That's amazing. And we need to develop fiction in order to grow the imagination of um, uh, our children. We need uh, for them to think in a proper way. Uh, and that will require writing, literature, media, we need female filmmakers documenting the, you know, the struggles of women and the experiences of women and the opinions of women regarding uh, Islam. Modest designers, it's so, it is such a pain, literally, when you go into a store and all we want is a pair of, you know, track pants, which are loose. And you, you don't have those. You don't have those anymore. And literally then you have to go to the male section and even those are tight. So we need modest designers, more of them. Not the ones, the influencer ones who are, you know, not really very modest, but actually somebody who is advised by a, a religious scholar and designing things that are absolutely Islamic. Female scientists, female leaders. And while they're doing all of this, the thing that roots them, the thing that gives them that strength is because they are committed. Female servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are dedicated to their, to their family. It's a hierarchy. First comes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it's his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, you have rights towards him, towards his religion. Then it's your family, your parents, your spouse, your children, your siblings, your family, your extended family, your neighbors. And there's a hierarchy. You have to root yourself in that hierarchy first and then when you have you have to develop your potential then after that then you're taking care of the ummah by being one of these and there's so many other fields to conquer the obstacles now that muslim women will face in their uh, you know th their struggle of of dealing with these challenges and also developing their potential while they're doing that. Because this is a two-way thing. You are volunteering in the path of Allah. That requires you to be developed yourself. You can't do that once if you're not spiritually, religiously developed and dedicated. So it's a, you're doing more and you're developing more. It's working on you. You're growing more. And But in this... Um, path of growth, you're going to face two kinds of obstacles. One would be the Islamophobic non-Muslim and who's going to throw at you some decontextualized uh, Quranic ayat and hadith to disempower you, to confuse you. What about this? What about that? And create a wedge. Literally, the, the, the agenda is so that the Muslim women are so alienated from their tradition, from their culture, from their religion, that then they find no other option than to go with the Western model of liberation, so-called liberation. And uh, that is not liberation. That is another form of objectification. That is another form of oppression. You know, uh, Alama Iqbal, he uh, said a beautiful um, uh, piece of poetry. He said that, uh, Zamani Hazir ne ata ki hai jo azadi. In essence, the present world that has given us the freedom, it's not really freedom, it is true ens enslavement. Because this idea of do whatever you want, you're free, wear whatever you want. You feel from the outside, zahir me to azadi. From the outside, it looks like freedom. Yes, I can wear what I want and I can do what I want and my body, my choice and all of that. But batin me giriftari, from the inside, from the batin, from the inside, it is enslavement. Because now you've become a slave to your own passions. It's all about you, me, me, me. Islam liberates you from all of that and makes you a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I'm not even a slave to my own self. Leave apart being a slave to customs and traditions and people and all of the society. I'm not even a slave to myself, which is the most subtle of slavery. But then there's another obstacle. 
which is unfortunate, is the ignorant Muslim who will also present decontextualized Quranic ayat and hadith to disempower Muslim women. And one such person that I found in my, uh, you know, uh, sort of work uh, is somebody known as Daniel Hakika Jew. He has such a I would say such a compromised understanding of, of uh, uh, you know, the role of women. And he has such a compromised understanding of even Western feminism, of which he boasts himself to be a leader uh, and, a, you know, a sort of uh, expert in, that it's, it's just appalling. And according to him, women must not be educated. Women must not work at all, at any condition. And uh, women must just strive only to you know be married and that's it that, that's it so clearly he doesn't know our history he doesn't know uh, the successive generations he doesn't have any idea of how these women were all of that they were women who married and had children and took care of them and on top of that they were highly educated and many of them worked and many of them traveled for work and we've seen Fatima bin Saad al Khair literally traveling from China to Africa just to study. There, uh, there was, uh, there's this uh, uh, story of this woman who was literally who had to travel because she was an expert uh, at calligraphy and she was uh, it was I think in uh, the era of again the Abbasid Caliphate that she had to travel uh, to the north of the Islamic Empire just to sign uh, just to create you know the uh, uh, peace treaty uh, a peace treaty uh, of the Muslims with the Byzant uh, Byzantine Empire and she was made to travel for work in the ninth century and then paid a huge amount by the king uh, of uh, that empire, the Muslim empire at that time. So I can, I can give you examples of examples of how the Sahabi had used to work. Uh, you know, uh, the famous uh, Sahabi uh, Ibn Mas'ud, uh, his wife used to work for him. She was the bread earner of the family. So clearly you're going to find these two obstacles, the Islamophobic non-Muslim and the ignorant Muslim who's going, uh, the, these uh, people who are going to, they have no understanding of Islam. They have no understanding of Islamic history. And they uh, are, are all about creating a wedge between the Muslim woman and our beautiful religion by giving us these decontextualized Quranic ayat. And uh, for them, the idea is that, again, it, it's nothing more than, you know, that narrow-minded idea of how a woman is only created to please a man. How, how, how terrible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to please him primarily, to worship him. Do not forgive, forget that. And do not, you know, get into, uh, you know, get, be affected by all of these ignorant opinions. Both can be defeated by means of knowledge and a better understanding of the Quran, Hadith, and Islamic literature. That is why it's important to know uh, our deen. It's important to know the Quran. It's important to know all of the Hadith that talk about how women were central to uh, Islam, and they were at the forefront. And that did not interfere in the fact that they were mothers, they were wives, no, none of that. And so uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah, he says the disempowerment of Muslim women, which is unfortunately the reality of today, is a major reason for the retrogression of many Muslim societies. You are going to disempower Muslim women. Don't think that it's just one gender that you're going to. You are literally causing the retrogression of many Muslim societies that we see in some, uh, you know, places like Bangladesh, places like Pakistan, India, these societies, the fact that there is so much abuse against women. And the sad part of it being that it's done with a religious sanction. It's done in the name of Islam because Allah gave this right. And that is absolute ignorance. 
Islam has a variety, uh, it has a rich legacy of accomplished and actively engaged women, he says. Great Muslim women excelled as political and military leaders, poets, uh, scholars, philanthropists, spiritual guides, and in other capacities, renewal of their legacy. That's what we're talking about. Now, this is something that we all need to work towards, men and women together renewal of this legacy of the female um, involvement and engagement in uh, Islam on all of these fronts is essential for the future of Muslim communities everywhere. If we don't work for this, I can tell you we are looking at a very dark future for Islam. I want to end, like I started with the story, I want to end with the story, and this is something to charge you and to give you that enthusiasm and that, you know, focus towards uh, this, this whole, you know, developing yourself by doing something for the Dean. And uh, I, I, I found this beautiful example and it's, it, it always in, in, inspires me and I'm sure it'll inspire you as well. So Uma Ammara, again, you can see with the kunya that she was a mother, she was a wife. Uh, her name was Nuseba bint Kaab. She had gone to Uhud as a nurse. Now we know that Uhud was a very tough battle after Badr. So Badr was a manifest victory. But Uhud, there were so many problems because when the Muslims uh, started winning, uh, the Prophet ﷺ had told a few archers on the mountain of Uhud to be there. And he told them, even if you see us losing and vultures literally devouring our bodies, do not come down until and unless I tell you to come down. But what happened was the Muslims started winning and uh, they started taking their booty. The archers on the mountain, they were like, oh, we won. And let's just go and take our share of booty because that's what they're seeing. They forgot about the command of the Prophet ﷺ. So they disobeyed him. And so they came down. When Khalid bin al-Walid, who was at that time not a Muslim, he saw this. He saw this weakness that they're now collecting the booty and they think that they've won. What he did was he came around the mountain of Uhud from the back. And that is the worst in a battle because you're surrounded. You have enemies from this side and then you have an uh, enemy from uh, attacking from the other side. And they were routed. They were in a very difficult situation, so much so that many of, because they were new Muslims, many of them fled because they got so scared. And many of uh, them were martyred. We know 70 of them who were martyred. And of them, the most uh, important was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza, and, and the Prophet ﷺ was injured. Uh, his blessed tooth uh, was martyred. And for some time, there was so much chaos in the battle that they actually thought that maybe the Prophet ﷺ has been martyred. And uh, he had gone up to the, he had, you know, receded to the mountain of Uhud. At that time, in all of this chaos, like total mess, uh, there was, you know, Nuseba bin Kaab. She had gone as a nurse. She didn't go at fight, even though women, there were few women who always accompany the Muslim men in uh, fighting and they were good at that. So she had gone as a, as, a, uh, as a nurse. But when she saw that the Muslims were surrounded by the enemy forces, what she did was she snatched one of the sword from the uh, soldier who was fleeing away. And she defended the Prophet wasallam, and at, at a time when he had only, it said in Sira, only seven to ten people surrounding him. So they made a human chain around him and she was one of them. And she was so, you know, uh, sort of important on that day that the Prophet ﷺ would praise her, keep praising her again and again. He, uh, when he would remember Uhud, he said, he would say that whenever I turned either to my left or my right, on the day of Uhud, I saw Nuseba bin Kaab fighting in my defense. She was like everywhere. And of course, it wasn't easy. You're just 10 people around the Prophet ﷺ till you take him to a place of safety. The non-Muslims are attacking you. She had so many wounds on her body and and that was her, that was her, you know, spiritual state. When she saw that I'm needed, it's a play, it's a time of crisis. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter what I am. I need to protect uh, the prophets allowed. So she left everything. She didn't think about her own self. She fought 
literally so uh, you know, heroically and courageously against uh, all of these non-Muslims. And then she continued this legacy when uh, the false prophet Musaylam al kazab uh, declared that he was a prophet after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi like uh, in the latter days of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then in the, uh, you know, the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, she was the one who said, I, you know, please include me in this battle. And after uh, he had been sort of injured uh, seriously, she was the one who struck him, who killed uh, this, this uh, liar. And this was a man who was responsible for many, many, many uh, people, uh, people's deaths. Uh, he, he was a terrible, terrible uh, you know, uh, person who did really bad stuff. But the point that I'm trying to make is we are not very different from that time. We may not have a physical combat, at least in the places that we are in, but the fact is that think of the Prophet Sallallahu as somebody who represents your deen, and he is somebody who represents your deen. What is being done is his honor is being violated. What is being done is his deen is being, you know, uh, demonized. Uh, propaganda is being hurled against this beautiful deen. What is being done is literally he's, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu lofty character is being, you know, turned into something which you wouldn't even think of, of any person in your logical mind, you know. It's so, so disgusting to even hear of what is being said about him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he is high and pure uh, from all of these allegations. But this is what they're doing against your prophet, your beloved prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his religion. This is very similar to the time when, when you know, there are people who are overwhelmed. So there are people who are running away. Think of those as people who are running away uh, from uh, the deen. It's too much for them to handle. Think of those who are going towards uh, the booty, like the archers. So the materialists in the ummah who don't really care about this and that, but uh, cared about what uh, is material. And at that time, what are you going to do? Be the Um Amara of your time and stand up and defend your Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your religion in your own capacity. It could be something very specific. It could be something very small and insignificant, like raising up a righteous child, like educating a righteous child, like being good to your parents. It could be something small. It doesn't have to be something, you know, monumental and I'm going to be this and I'm going to do that. No, but do something which in which you would be able to sort of meet him in a sense where you didn't let people, uh, you know, uh, speak against him. You were there and you defended him literally with your own uh, body, your own self, your intellect, everything you utilized in this part, just like um, Amara. She didn't think of, you know, I have sons, I have a family to take care of. I have a husband. What am I going? I, anyways, I came as a nurse. I can easily, I wasn't really meant to fight. No, she took the sword and she made this human chain uh, around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is our role model. That is our role model. That is who we should take uh, guidance and uh, inspiration from. Because that's exactly, I don't see a difference uh, from that time and this time. Actually, we are in a worse condition, to be honest. And above all, like we said, we talked about the ignorant Muslim being an obstacle in our path. Will you let this religion be hijacked by those kind of people who say that women must not be educated? who say that it's, you know, domestic violence uh, is what is mentioned in uh, Surah Nisra. No, the Prophet Sallallahu the uh, was the a walking, talking Quran. He never hit a woman. So how can we interpret the Quran other than what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi who, on whom was the Quran related? How can we interpret the Quran in a contradiction with his uh, uh, practice? Did he not have problems with his wives? Did he, he was, literally he divorced Haf, uh, Hafsa radiallahu anh. He had problems with his wives. He used to get angry. 
but he didn't do this. That means that's not how you interpret that ayat. And that's not what uh, Islam wants. So are we going to let this religion, this beautiful religion, be hijacked by ignorant people who say that you can hit your wife when she goes out of limits? What, what rubbish is that? We need to change this. So we need to defend this beautiful religion from the onslaught of both non-Muslims who are Islamophobic, who are on an agenda, and also ignorant Muslims who have no understanding. And all they are uh, doing is just projecting their own ignorance and their own misogyny and their own uh, you know, uh, lowly values and very narrow um, understanding of the world onto this beautiful religion the religion that saw the first Muslim being a, a woman, the first martyr being a uh, woman, uh, scholars being women, you know. So I would uh, end by giving you a few recommended readings. Uh, these books are just amazing for you to learn from. I really suggest reading them and I've used them extensively in my presentation. And also keep in touch if you liked uh, what I had to say, uh, you can uh, read what I uh, write on Medium, on my own website. Uh, no, uh, I'm the director of uh, this institute uh, in the UK. Uh, we are all about, as you can see, the second golden age, the revivalistic efforts and talking about the past in a way that we can revive our future. So that's why in the, on the poster, we have the old scientists and you know, portraits and sketches of uh, the, uh, you know, the spiritual masters, scientists, philosophers, scholars, theologians, and then on the other hand, we have uh, the more modern, um, you know, scholars and activists and uh, commentators of uh, the religion. We want to be like the breeding ground of thinking Muslims. And that's what I uh, work towards in my second Golden Age series. You can Google that up. I've left you the links. And I'm also going to sh share this presentation with you all because I don't want it to just end here. I want you all who've been with me throughout this presentation, pretty much a very long presentation, to be so well versed with these names, memorize these names, memorize their stories, take this presentation and educate uh, your family members. Present this presentation to uh, your children, to your siblings, to your family, to your friends in your school, in your Sunday school, your workshops. Uh, so I'm going to share this presentation with everyone. Subhanakallah, Allah, Bihamdik, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha Ilaha, Astaghfirullah, Tubi,